I've been lucky to have uh, quite supportive advisors throughout uh, my career, really, without whom none of this would have been possible. Um, so for my research talk, I want to uh, give a bit of an overview about the field that I'm working in now. Uh, I've uh, moved a bit away from physics, but the nice thing about physics is that you can really do anything that you want with a physics degree, uh, because if you boil anything uh, down to its components, it ends up being physics. If you go a bit further, then it ends up being math, of course, but uh, that's a different story. Um, so uh, yeah, I, the way I got here is that uh, after I did biophysics in Linz, I uh, did bioengineering then in, during my doctorate. And so now uh, I'm continuing in this sort of uh, combination of electrical engineering, uh, biology, uh, biophysics um, with work on organs on chips. And uh, yeah, my talk is going to introduce the, what organs on chips are uh, with, and at uh, one example from my own research there. So uh, why, what's the motivation for doing organs on chips uh, without really knowing at this point maybe what they are? Um, so it comes down to this, uh, that uh, for many many things really in medical science, we need to understand human biology. Uh, so we want to figure out how human organ systems work to treat diseases uh, to, for better diagnostics and so on. Uh, but the way pharmaceutical research and biological research mostly works is that we need to use model systems because humans, we don't like our brains cut into or our other organs really. So Instead, we have lab animals and cell culture models. Now, animal models are nice in that they have these whole organ systems that interact with each other, just like humans do, but ultimately they aren't obviously humans. Uh, so there's just some very basic differences in how organs are organized. Uh, the second option is to just have cells in these plastic uh, Petri dishes where you can have human cells but it doesn't really look like an organ anymore. And so this disconnect between the models that we're actually uh, doing our basic clinical pharmaceutical research with uh, versus what it should eventually be applied to is one of the big reasons for uh, clinical trial failures. So after all the testing on animals and cell culture models going to humans, uh, around 75% fail because of uh, safety or efficacy not translating across this gap. And this is where some uh, new technologies are trying to bridge the gap. Uh, the first is so-called in silico models, which is using computer modeling to uh, use existing knowledge about existing drugs to predict what might happen. Uh, organoids and some advanced cell culture models. And lastly, organs on chips, which is what I'll be talking about. So organs on chips are supposed to combine a number of things in a single package. Uh, they're supposed to combine relevant cells, relevant environments, both physically and chemically, and relevant readouts in a single package. And the important point about them is that they're engineered packages. So there are these uh, small engineered systems with small uh, microfluidic channels inside them where the cells can grow and where we can really control the environment uh, in a very targeted manner. I'll show a bit of a closer view in a little bit, but uh, for now the point is that it sort of combines the control that we have in standard cell culture models, so placing cells exactly where we want them and placing exactly the right cells where we want them, with some of the complexity that we have in actual animal models. Um, the plot here, I have to admit, is a bit optimistic. I would probably place them closer to the midpoint here, but they, they can bridge a critical gap between these extremes. Now, this is what a stereotypical organ on chip would look like. This one has been around for uh, 10 years uh, where the whole field sort of kicked off um, at Harvard in the United States by uh, Don Ingber. And so what this is, is a sort of silicone plastic, uh, so sort of flexible rubbery uh, thing with these small 
uh, tubes like uh, like ducts inside, which we call microfluidic channels. Uh, so here they're filled with colored liquids, just so we can see um, what that looks like. And then when we zoom in the, the cross section, that will look something like this. So we have two compartments where we can grow our cells. And so in this case, in one compartment, we would have uh, cells that, from the human gut. Uh, and on the other side, we would have cells uh, from human blood vessels. And there's a membrane in between, so we can actually put them there without the whole thing falling apart but they can still interact chemically and even physically by interconnecting like they would in the human body. And so what uh, this is supposed to model is the human gut, of course, and specifically with something like this, we could study, uh, for instance, how well drugs get absorbed in the human gut into the bloodstream. And then you can imagine having another one like of these just instead of um, gut cells up here, you place lung cells, and you can study how well a medication passes from the bloodstream into the lung, for instance, for uh, COVID treatment. It, that's a very big question, and they've actually looked at that with uh, these devices. Um, now, my specific work is uh, trying to address a few open questions in this field to really move it to the next level. Um, First, uh, using better cell types to, uh, to get better, uh, better disease models, because a lot of the modeling uh, right now that's happening with these is using healthy cells. Uh, so we can study things like drug transport, but it's, uh, there are not very many examples of being able to actually study diseases like uh, Huntington's. Uh, people have recently shown that uh, we can actually uh, have a model of that in one of these organon chips to see how uh, how cells from a Huntington's patient specifically respond uh, to medication and so on. Uh, the next parts are a bit more on the engineering side. Uh, so the materials that we make these, uh, the, these devices out of, uh, there's a lot of room of improvement. Uh, most people use the same one that I showed you, the silicone rubber, but there's some uh, engineering reasons to try to avoid that. Um, ideally, we also want to see what's actually going on inside these things as the cells are growing and interacting, uh, which would make it more, so we can do dynamic studies, uh, seeing the time courses of drugs and so on. And that's very difficult with current designs. So by placing sensors in there, uh, that should actually be possible, right? Because as you know from your phones, uh, sensors these days can be really tiny things. So if we also put them in these microfluidics, then uh, we can get continuous monitoring of what's really happening in our cell models. And then the last big question is, of course, uh, extrapolating the data we get from these devices, uh, the in vitro data, to what happens in vivo. And uh, there's some, uh, yeah, there's uh, really now uh, the phase of this field where we can see that, yes, uh, we can actually translate what these devices are used for into clinical practice and so sort of fulfill the promise of why the whole field was conceived. Um, so uh, on the cell biology part, um, as I said, we want really functional cells that sort of recapitulate what's going on inside us humans. And the, the best answer in most cases, or well, in many cases anyway, for this is induced pluripotent stem cells. So where we take uh, skin cells from, uh, from healthy humans or from patients and then reprogram them to become stem cells that can afterward become any type of cell. So we can generate endothelial cells, which is sort of the lining of your blood vessels and all the support cells that, that interact with these cells because um, Current approaches often you have only one cell type, but as I said, we really need to look at the interactions that go on between all these different cell types because that's what's actually happening in our bodies. And uh, you might notice that I'm uh, talking mostly about the brain, which is, uh, yeah, that just happens to be the focus of uh, our lab here. And I think it's the most interesting organ anyway, but uh, the same ideas apply to really most other organ systems that we have. Uh, this is what uh, my specific organ on chip looks like uh, that I created here in Stockholm. Uh, so it sort of has the same general 
geometry as the one I showed you earlier. There's these microfluidic channels in there that are, uh, yeah, um, where the cells can grow and form these layers that interact with each other. And then uh, one of the differences is, is that we, I actually have sensors in there so I can see what's going on. So what this is showing is, um, yeah, how uh, the blood brain barrier forms and then breaks down. And this is what that looks like. So the purple cells here are the endothelial lining. So the actual wall that protects your brain from uh, just anything coming inside and uh, uh, like disease agents or also medication, uh, it's a double-edged sword, uh, is, is very tightly, uh, uh, it's very tight and uh, really trying to protect your brain there. Um, so that those cells in purple, and then in the sort of uh, green, green bluish color, we have uh, the support cells that can interact with them. And then the sensor gives us this data where we see how the barrier is established. And then importantly, uh, what happens when we apply different treatments. So usually um, when you don't have sensors, you would just, look at the whole thing maybe twice, once here, and then once here, and then compare the differences. But you wouldn't really know that much about what happens in between here. Uh, what we can do with the integrated sensors is that it's just very easy to follow the whole time course and really see the dynamics of the system. So we can, uh, so we can more closely study the dynamic process because usually when you're actually taking medication, right, you're uh, not constantly dosing at the same dose throughout the day. Uh, it's actually, the, it's the case if you're maybe hanging on an IV drip of something, but most day-to-day -day medication just doesn't work like that. So we usually have some time-dependent phenomena that we would like to study. And so, yeah, um, organs on chips these days uh, is really a rapidly growing uh, exciting field, bringing together aspects of engineering, biology, and, and many others. Uh, and so I always find this sort of interdisciplinary work really exciting. And it is also actually solving um, a clinical challenge and uh, seems up to the task. So we can model different functions of the blood-brain barrier and uh, show that it behaves uh, pretty much the same as in humans, uh, as it does in our organs and chips. Uh, we can study how drugs pass across this barrier and, um, and the metabolic response of these cells is something that I've been focusing on. Uh, disease models are now starting to emerge. There's still some challenges, of course, but uh, yeah, that's why research is interesting, isn't it? So with that, I am open for questions. <laughs>